So I'd like to start this talk with a big ask from each one of you. And my ask is this. So I want you to identify the person sat next to you. And if you came in here with someone, which I'm sure most of you did, not that person, OK? The really scary stranger on the other side of you. OK, have you found them? OK. All right, OK, OK. Don't get too friendly. Um, so what's going to happen is this. I'm going to count down in a moment from five seconds, and you are going to turn to that person, and you are going to look them really intensely in the eyes for the entire five seconds, OK? And it's going to feel awkward. Just embrace the discomfort. OK, can you turn towards them? OK. Wait, 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 wait. On your marks. <laughs> Get set. Stare. Five, four, three, two, one. OK, right, you can resume staring back at me now. So, on a scale of 1 to 10, if I was to ask you how deeply uncomfortable was that experience for you just now, probably most of you would say, well, it was pretty uncomfortable. It's not kind of what I had planned for my Friday afternoon. You'd probably say an 8 or a 9 out of 10. But I'd ask you to think really carefully about that. Because was the entire experience deeply uncomfortable? I mean, sure, the few nanoseconds when I first came onto the stage and explained what you're about to do, that was probably pretty uncomfortable, right? And then maybe when you first turned to face one another. But after that, when I started counting down from five, that was okay, right? Because by then, what had happened is you'd kind of settled into the discomforts, and your mind and your body, well, it was concentrating on the task in hand. I call these B. BMDs. And as the editor of Cosmopolitan, I have to have full disclaimer here, BMD does not stand for some new weird sexual subculture, as much as it sounds like that. BMD stands for Brief Moments of Discomfort. In other words, transitory moments of tension as you stand in the doorway of transformation. Because that is what discomfort does. It transforms. It helps us grow. Now, I should probably just qualify here by saying I'm not talking today about the sort of discomfort that happens as a result of deep-seated trauma. I'm talking more about the discomfort that each of us faces day in, day out, week after week, month after month. Your BMD just now? Well, that was turning to face the stranger next to you. Your moment of transformation? That was connecting with another human being. But here's the current problem. We currently live in a society which has real issue with discomfort. You know, children's homework for many years now is not marked an aggressive red pen, but in the softer rainbow markings of gentle pink and subtle green. Universities, we're starting to see the escalation of these places called safe spaces, where students can retreat to if they feel wounded or uncomfortable by certain words or ideas. We even do it to ourselves, I know I do, by self-selecting to exist in an online world where you need only ever bump up against the opinions and worldviews which sit comfortably with your own. And this is a grave, grave problem, because we are willfully sleepwalking into a world whose very foundations are made of comfort. And in doing that, we are not only robbing society, we are not only robbing future generations, but we are robbing ourselves the opportunity to transform. So I know all about living in a world whose foundations are made of comfort. I was, um, I was a middle child. I was the classic third or fourth. Um, and I had elder siblings. And what that did is it shielded me from a lot. So an elder popular sister at school meant that I was protected at all times by sharking bullies. A cool older brother meant that I always swerved the slings and arrows of outrageous behavior by male teens. When those two siblings moved from our hometown of Manchester down to London, 
Just as soon as I was old enough, I dutifully followed them without even questioning it. I lived in a world, I existed in a world, which was so ready-made and kind of pre-digested for me by those who had come before, that actually, I was a static person. I remember waking up one day as I was sliding out of my teens and, and, and heading into my 20s and realizing two things. One, I had no idea of who I was. And two, I had no idea of who I had the potential to become. And so, just four weeks shy of my 21st birthday, I did something radical, or radical at least for me. I threw myself into my first genuine moment of discomfort, and I booked myself a one-way ticket to go and live in Paris. Now, just to give you a sense of how deeply uncomfortable that was for me at the time, I was 20 years old. I'd never traveled anywhere by myself outside of Manchester by alone. I also could barely speak a word of French. So I remember just to get breakfast in the morning, because I hardly knew any words, I had to, first of all, I had to find the most smiley, cheeriest boulangerie, which if anyone that's been to Paris can imagine, <laughs> there aren't many of those. And it was always really busy, so I'd have to go in. And um, typically, the baguettes that I wanted were behind the till. So I had to stand there in front of all of these Parisian women, and I had to mime eating a baguette <laughs> every morning. Yeah, you can imagine, some of you, what, what, how that went down. Um, unbeknownst to me, I also got a job teaching English to French students, not realizing I got a job in the toughest school in the toughest suburb. And even though I'd only ever lived with my family up until then, out of desperation, not being able to find anywhere to live, I moved into an apartment in Montmartre with two professional clowns and a three-legged cat called Knit. And this is no joke. The cat, I later found out, had willfully thrown herself off the sixth floor balcony. Um, after having lived with the clowns for a year, I understood exactly uh, why that was. <laughs> so there we were, um, living cheek by jowl in this tiny, tiny apartment high above the rooftops of Paris, um, which I'm fully aware makes it sound like so romantic and charming and kind of the inspiration for Amelie, um, when really the truth is, uh, it was far more like an homage to Rising Damp, I can tell you. Um, and I was uncomfortable. I was deeply, deeply uncomfortable and well within my discomfort zone. But here's the thing. The entire experience was not uncomfortable. It was just punctuated by brief moments of discomfort. So, for example, turning up to a party by myself looking to try and make friends getting on a bus in the morning and not being able to communicate with the bus driver, ask whether the, the bus was on its way into Paris or was on its way out of Paris. I had to try and control a room of 40 very angry teenage French boys with the power of mime and gesticulation alone. Each one of these BMDs were thrown upon me, and I simply had to deal with them without a roadmap. And yet, as I dealt with each one of them, I started to notice small transformations taking place within me. I discovered that actually, I was okay at navigating my way around even the cliquiest Parisian party. I discovered that, contrary to belief, I was all right at public speaking, and I could kind of handle a room full of people. But most of all, I discovered that I was tough and I was street smart in a way that I had never believed an introverted middle child could be. And so this is why it is an absolute mistake to shield ourselves from discomfort. You know, discomfort is not something to be protected from. It's something to be exposed to. Discomfort is not struggle. Discomfort is challenge. Discomfort does not diminish us. Discomfort empowers us and transforms us and helps us grow. Discomfort is what the human body and mind is built for. So many of our greatest leaders and thinkers only came to be who they were because they were forced into their moments of discomfort. And by, by being forced into those moments, they pushed against the parameters of who they believed they were and discovered a whole new personal horizon beyond there. Winston Churchill, for much of his career, was actually seen as nothing more than a querulous backbencher. 
But it was only when he was thrust into the role of Prime Minister at probably one of the most uncomfortable times in British history with a world war on the horizon that he found not only his voice as an orator, but his strength as a leader. I'll give you another example. One of my heroes, Steven Spielberg. Again, arguably one of the greatest living creators of our time. But very early on in Spielberg's career, when he was filming a film many of you have probably seen, Jaws, Spielberg had decided he was going to use this huge mechanical shark to show Jaws. But very early on in filming, there was a malfunction with the shark. It was complete disaster, because Spielberg found out that actually the malfunction wouldn't be fixed until they were near the end of filming. With time ticking and diminishing budgets, Spielberg was forced to push against the parameters of his creativity and come up with another way. Now, for those of you that have seen Jaws here, you'll realize that actually, Jaws is chilling, not because you see the shark, but because you don't. Spielberg actually worked on showing murky water shots and leaned on John Williams' masterful two-note score to denote whenever the fish was in the water. And I think you'll all agree, it's one of the most masterful pieces of filmmaking there is. Now, these are just two examples, but I could give you many, many more. Because the truth is, life is wonderful, but life is also really tough. And in order to survive in a tough world, we need strength. Strength which is created by being exposed to discomfort, not fragility created by being coddled from it. So we need leaders, and we need thinkers, and we need doers, and we even need sit-backers who are comfortable with the uncomfortable. We need people who are built for battle, not created for collapse. Millennials are our largest living adult population, and yet we choose to call them Generation Snowflake, a largely pejorative term which hints not at their strength, but at their fragility. And that is a mistake for them, and it is a mistake for us. Instead, I choose to call them Generation Snowdrop. Because snowdrops, just like snowflakes, appear in the deepest, darkest, most uncomfortable depths of winter. They raise their tiny, shivering heads, knowing it is a time of great discomfort. Snowdrops can withstand frost, sub-zero temperatures, and even snow. In fact, they don't just survive, but they thrive. Plant a snowdrop one year in your border, and watch the following year as you have a whole border of them. The year after that, a whole garden. The year after that, who knows, an incredible gleaming white forest. So my message to you today is be a snowdrop. When challenge approaches, raise your head from the ground. When discomfort is close, stand up to it, step into it, and step through it. Because I promise you, if you start stepping into your discomfort zone, starting from now, on the other side, you will find your personal greatness. Thank you.